Hello everyone, this is Rebecca Arvin with the Water Environment Federation. I want to welcome each of you to the Construction Inspection for Trenchless Rehabilitation webcast, sponsored by NASCO with the support of LMK Technologies. Before we begin, I would like to quickly review a few logistics. All of the PDF PowerPoint presentations are available for downloading at West FTP link. This link was distributed via email yesterday and will be distributed again tomorrow for anyone that registered after the time of distribution. The FTP link for this webcast also has information on how to receive professional development hours for those eligible to receive these training credits. There are two PDH credits for this webcast. You will need to complete the evaluation form to receive the PDH certificate. Your feedback on this webcast is important and helps identify future webcast topics that are timely and helpful to you. Please follow the PDH instructions and check with your state accreditation agency on how to receive this credit. During this webcast, while you cannot speak directly to the presenters, you will, however, have an opportunity to submit questions by typing in your specific question via the question pane that appears on your PC. Today's moderator, Ted DeBoda, will be accumulating questions and direct them to the presenters at the end of the webcast. We will be recording this webcast. A link will be sent to all registered users tomorrow so that you can share with other colleagues who could not attend this webcast. If you have any additional questions after the webcast has ended, please email webcast with an S at web.org. Before we get started, I have a poll question for everyone. The question is, how many people are participating today in the webcast at your computer? If you're participating by yourself, go ahead and respond one. If you're participating in a con conference room, for example, or have several people gathered around your computer, just do a quick head count. Great. Thank you so much for participating. It looks like we have all the votes in. And I'll go ahead and share that. We have 71% today participating by themselves. So I would like to thank Ted for moderating the webcast today. Ted DeBoda is currently the Executive Director at NASCO. Ted? Thanks, Rebecca. And good afternoon, everyone, or morning to those of you calling from the West Coast. Uh, today's webcast is titled Construction Inspection for Trenchless Rehabilitation. My name is Ted DeBoda, and I'll be your moderator for this afternoon's webcast. Uh, this webcast is being sponsored by NASCO, which is the National Association of Sewer Service Companies with uh, support from LMK Technologies. NASCA's one goal over the past 35 years has been to improve the success rate of everyone involved in the pipeline rehabilitation industry, and hopefully that's all of us. Uh, we hope that the information that we provide in this webcast will improve the success rate of your trenchless rehabilitation project. Just by way of a little background, I can tell you as a young engineer, I learned very quickly how important a knowledgeable project inspector was towards the success of, of the jobs. In fact, almost all successful public works projects have knowledgeable inspectors. Now, of course, they're referred to as uh, RPRs. Um, but knowledgeable inspectors uh, we're finding um, are even a budgeted expense in either the construction or the design uh, budget of, of projects. Now that we're doing more transless projects than ever before, people are, are realizing the financial, environmental, and human benefits of these trenches technologies. What we are finding is that there's different skill sets required for inspectors uh, for the success of these projects, different from what we've normally considered during uh, the skill sets for open cut pipe replacement. So some of the discussion points we're going to talk about uh, really is going to provide uh, both a municipal and a manufacturer's perspective. Um, and we're going to make that connection from detailed rehabilitation planning to real solid engineering finally to a comprehensive uh, construction inspection. And at that point, we'll present some of the new skill sets that our inspectors require. Our presenters this afternoon will be uh, Tim Back from Back Municipal Consulting, LLC. He's going to provide a municipal perspective. Sahar Hassan from LMK Technologies will give us a manufacturer's perspective on the importance of good project inspection. And finally, Jerry Munchmeyer, NASCO's technical director, will explain some of the unique inspection requirements that trenches rehabilitation pose 
and the training that's available for that. Now, Rebecca mentioned uh, submitting questions. I want to kind of elaborate a little bit on that. We're going to take time at the end of the three presentations to answer your questions. Uh, as the questions come up, go ahead and submit them. Uh, if it makes sense, go ahead and let us know if it's uh, directed towards a specific person or just the panel in general. And we'll address as many as we can in the time we have at the end of, of, of this webcast. So our first speaker will be Tim Back. Tim's a registered engineer who's been in the industry for 18 years. Tim has extensive experience in the city of Cincinnati's Metropolitan Sewer District, and he specializes in product selection, specifications, and inspection for Trensis Technologies. Tim's an active member of NASCO and was very helpful in the development of the ITCP program, that's the Inspector Training and Certification Program, for manhole rehabilitation. Uh, he was also instrumental in NASCO's performance specifications for the renovation of manhole structures, which you can find uh, on the NASCO website. He currently serves as the first chair of NASCO's uh, Manhole Rehabilitation Committee. And in addition to NASCO, Tim's active in WEF and AWWA. And he currently serves as the president of BAC Municipal Consulting, located in Cincinnati, Ohio. Tim? Thanks, Ted. Um, my presentation today uh, takes a look at the municipal side of inspection for trenchless rehabilitation. Uh, today, municipalities are facing the ongoing problem of failing infrastructure, and in an effort to effectively convey and treat sewage, municipalities are constantly renewing old components. Typical components that are in need of repair are sewer main lines, laterals, manholes, and main for lateral connections. Traditional construction consists of digging a trench to expose the, expose the failed components and then replacing or repairing them. Some of the concerns municipalities have with this type of repair is traffic disruption, lengthy inconvenience to residents, safety concerns of passerbys or unsuspecting pedestrians, which ultimately results in unhappy residents. The same type of concerns hold true for the traditional construction techniques for homeowners when they deal with their lateral pipe. With digging comes unavoidable concerns. Disruption of homeowners' garden or landscaping, destruction of sidewalks and driveways, additional safety concerns near their home, and most likely you've got to deal with angry homeowners. Trenchless construction has been around the United States for over 40 years. Trenchless products are used to rehabilitate and restore underground infrastructure back to its original or better than original condition without your tra traditional excavating equipment. Municipalities use trenchless for many reasons. It offers competitive pricing to traditional, to traditional excavation. Typically, trenchless installation has a smaller equipment footprint and therefore less traffic disruption. Also, you can see when working in yards, the minimal equipment needed is less invasive than a backhoe or an excavator. Some trenchless products offer better than original flow characteristics. Often, trenchless products require to have a 50-year design life associated with it. And the cities are able to get more work done in a shorter period of time when the trenchless methods are utilized. And the major reason why municipalities use trenchless technology methods is happy taxpayers. So the question arises for these types of trenchless products, projects, uh, to inspect or not to inspect. Definitely when it comes, the cities have a choice when it comes to the level of inspection for their construction projects. A deciding factor on whether to provide an inspector on a trenchless project is cost. The city can either pay now or pay later. This refers to an inferior installation without the presence of a trained inspector in which a product may have to be replaced at a later date, or the ineffectiveness of a product to stop water, therefore resulting in future treatment costs. Not just any old inspector will make a difference. Trained, certified inspectors give, give the municipality the best chance for a successful project. The trained inspector has to know certain things, responsibilities. They should know the specifications, a good understanding of the intentions 
in the details of a specification can go a long way in providing the, the city with proper uh, good understanding of the intentions of the details of, excuse me, of, a, of a specification go a long way in providing the proper inspection to get the desired end result. The training inspector should know the products that are being installed. Product limitations, troubleshooting, installation techniques are some of the details about a product that an inspector should know. The inspector should be one to review all the required submittals. This is the information that the inspector will be referencing as the contractor does the job. The inspector should also be familiar with a contractor performance work statement. The performance work statement contains information about how the contractor is going about getting the job done. Installation procedures, safety items, detailed work schedule are some of the items contained in the performance work statement. Specifications for trenchless projects come from a wide variety of places. For example, the National Association of Sewer Service Companies is a resource for specifications for the trenchless industry. For industry standards, most city and consulting engineers refer to ASTM standards that are applicable to the particular product or aspect of the project. Some of the ASTMs that exist for trenchless technology for mainline are ASTM 1216, which is a standard practice for rehabilitation of existing pipelines and conduits by inversion and curing of a resin impregnated tube, sort of the Bible for mainline CIPP. Also, ASTM 5813, that's a standard specification for cured in place thermosetting resin sewer piping systems. ASTM 1743, standard practice for pooled in place, cured in place resin, uh, thermosetting resin pipe. In ASTM 2990, the method to measure tensile, compressive, and flexile creep of plastics. Also in the main lines, you have ASTM 2599. This is for a sectional or point repair of a sewer using cured in place pipe. In ASTM 2454, is for the grouting of mainline joints and fracks. For manholes, you have ASTM 2551. It's for cementitious manhole rehabilitation. And 2414 is for grouting of manholes. And finally, ASTM 2561 is a standard practice for rehabilitation of a sewer service lateral and its connection to the main using a one-piece main and lateral cured in place liner. And these are just a few of, of what's out there in our industry. So typical specifications have uh, certain requirements. Uh, for instance, pipes must be cleaned and roots from roots, debris, and deposits. Also, the product should be pre-approved prior to bidding. Let's take a look at uh, pre-approving products. By setting certain criteria, inferior products can be eliminated. If specific third-party testing, for example, cannot be verified, then those products can be eliminated. Products that are not based on sound engineering principles, they can be eliminated. Products that don't meet, meet the applicable ASPM standards, they can be eliminated. And finally, products that can't meet or achieve the project goals can be eliminated. And what you're left with are products or product that has the best chance of success. Also, some typical specification requirements. Uh, typically, an inspector will review the submittals provided by the contractor and the manufacturer. Items such as the material certifications, third-party testing data, the performance work statement that we mentioned, and a project schedule. Specifications will typically include items, safety items, that the contractor must follow. In some cities, the inspector has the authority to shut down the job when he feels the work site is unsafe. In other cases, the inspector will document and relay the information back to the city to evaluate contractor safety habits or lack of them. 
Other specification items require that the installed product meets certain design criteria for 50-year design life, as in ASTM 1216, Appendix X1 for mainline pipe. Also, vacuum impregnation using extra resin is typically included in mainline pipe specifications. Curing schedules are reviewed to make sure the liner has had sufficient time to cure and pull down. Typical requirements are also for a one-piece liner instead of two pieces or three in, in which there are no joints. Also, the use of end pipe seals to ensure that the water does not enter the manhole from outside of the annular space of the cured-in-place pipe. Typical specification requirements for the lateral to main connection liners are similar to that of main line in that they should follow the design standards of ASTM 1216. In addition, ASTM 2561 should be followed. This includes a one-piece liner, again, no joints or no two-piece, a house address and liner and resin information located under the coating near the house tap, known as a lateral indicia, vacuum impregnation of the resin into the liner, hydrophilic seals to act as a watertight gasket to allow the service life of the product to extend past the design life of the product. And also tapered ends for smooth transitions of flow in and out of the liner. And no pressure interruption to ensure the host pipe cannot collapse onto the liner during curing. Typical specification requirements for manhole rehab include stopping all the leaks before you apply your product and also prepping the manhole or cleaning the manhole uh, prior to application. Thickness requirements are typically included in specifications. The inspector has several tools to verify thickness, such as a wet film thickness gauge for epoxy coatings and a small diameter wires to verify the thickness of cementitious coatings. Typically, the ASTM standards hold more weight than the manufacturer recommendations. ASTMs are recognized as industry standards and have been peer-reviewed for accuracy and relevance. Also, an inspector should realize that when it comes to knowing the full capabilities and limitations, the manufacturers are the experts. However, an inspector must not always believe everything a manufacturer says. Rather, question any discrepancies between what is going on in the field, and what is written in the specifications. Ultimately, it is the manufacturer that is responsible for the product meeting the ASTM standards and providing a viable product for the project. Why is all this important? It comes down to quality assurance and inspection of the trenchless project product. QAQC items that the inspector should be made aware of and verify of the quality that is built into the products before installation. These things include top quality raw materials, proper documentation of manufacturing, and assembly by skilled professionals. Properly con quality control procedures, including factory pressure and dye testing of the liners in the seams, and in-house third-party testing of the liners. Other tests that the inspector should witness and verify are adhesion testing for manhole coatings, restrained sample testing for mainline CIPP to verify proper physical properties, eye testing connections to verify they are leak-free, and material physical property testing. Other quality control testing that takes place in the field are spark testing for manhole rehab coatings, pressure testing for liners, and vacuum testing for manhole rehabilitation products. So some recommendations for success is to have an inspector on site. The inspector should be prepared to enter the manhole, both for manhole rehab, but also for to check out the ends of the CIPP product coming into the manhole. Ensure that specification references references the ASTM standards 
ensure a 50-year design life and service life, and also uh, that the product or project is engineered for long-term performance. Also verify that the contractor follows the specifications, including an outside clean-out, which is instrumental and excellent inspection tool for when laterals and connection liners are rehabbed. Impose longer contract or warranty period. Be proactive in inspection certification and training processes. And conduct follow-up inspections of the product. It's also recommended that the products are inspected for any leakage mm -hmm. after installation, such as around Such as, sorry, my computer is uh, messing up here. Tim, do you want me to push your slides for you? Um, maybe. Let me. Uh, okay, I think, looks like uh, you got it back. Up. Okay, let's try it. Uh, it's recommended that the products are inspected for leakage after installation, such as at the end of the cure to place towards the, the lateral ends, towards the lateral, at the end of the lateral, and also at the end of the CIPP. Also uh, checking to make sure that connection liners don't leak. This is often difficult. In some, in some cases, it's the time that they are leaking when it's raining, and that's when you have uh, when the pipe is full. And also to make sure that manholes don't leak after they're rehabbed. It's also recommended that the products get a follow-up warranty inspection. This is critical in determining if the correct product was chosen the first time and determine if it was money well spent. More and more contractors are increasing their warranty based on the fact that the inspector of the city does not have the resources to follow up inspections. It is the single most important thing that will ensure that the product is doing its job over a long period of time. Inspectors are not all alike. Inspectors can be certified to the specific industry and type of product that they will be inspecting. Trained inspectors make better inspectors. NASCO has several programs to train and certify inspectors for cured in place pipe, manhole rehabilitation, and pipe bursting. Inspectors should also be confined space entry certified for entering manholes to check out the ends of cured in place pipe to make sure they're not leaking and to inspect the manhole rehab products from inside the manhole. Other inspections may include a NACE certification, which is the National Association of Corrosion Engineers for coating products. The utilization of trained certified inspectors typically results in project successes, such as cured in place pipe, connection liners, and manholes. Projects that proceed without inspectors or inferior inspectors can result in project failures. These are the types of things that the owners fear and can result in project delays and a trenchless project becoming a trenched project. The photos show what can happen when liners are resin deficient or not properly cured. Improper prep work, improperly installed products, and oversized liners can be avoided before installation with proper inspection. By having an inspection protocol and trained certified inspectors, the results increase quality. Acceptable finished products, projects that finish on time, and all these things add up to long-term results. Inspectors are responsible for detailed pro project documentation documented items such as installation procedures, unusual circumstances, curing times, temperatures, product production rates, and potential failures. And these items are what's used for warranty claims and future uh, investigations for, for failures. A trained and certified inspector is well worth it and leads to a satisfied owner and a happy contract. And overall, a successful project. In summary, trenchless technology is a viable option for construction 
and trained certified inspectors make a difference for long-term service life of a product or a project. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Our next speaker will be Sahar Hassan. Sahar is the Applications Engineer with LMK Technologies. She has a master's degree in civil engineering focusing on trenches technologies from the University of Texas at Arlington. She's also the first recipient of the Michael E. Argent Scholarship awarded by NASTT, where she serves as an active member. She's also active in WEF, ASTM, AWWA, as well as NASCO. LMK is fortunate to have Sahar to oversee the technical aspects of their sales and marketing. Sahar? Thank you very much, Mr. Deboda. Uh, good morning and good afternoon. Um, my presentation today will take you through the overview of laterals, um, trenches rehabilitation technologies, um, issues that are normally faced uh, when performing lateral rehabilitation, specification standards uh, related to this rehabilitation, quality assurance and testing requirements, and also the benefits of having a trained inspector on the project. To give you a quick lateral rehabilitation background, lateral pipes that are being renewed or rehabilitated today were constructed 40 plus years ago. Uh, there is no need to emphasize the fact that these pipes are definitely in dire need of rehabilitation. Laterals make up a very integral element of the sanitary sewer collection system. Um, however, unfortunately, the condition of laterals has remained largely ignored for a very long time. Failing laterals can be responsible for issues such as sewage backups, inflow and infiltration, and a host of other problems. There are two types of laterals that are encountered in the field, one public and the other private. A public lateral is when the local government body assumes responsibility for either the entire lateral or a section of the lateral extending from the property line to the main line. A private lateral is where the entire lateral is a concern of the property or business owner. Privately owned under, underground sections of laterals are often taken for granted until a problem such as a massive sewage backup occurs um, and it cannot be ignored. Laterals are typically four to six inches uh, in diameter uh, with an average length of around 75 feet. They are typically lo located six to 10 feet underground um, and usually exit at the lowest point of the residence or the building that they are connecting to the main line. Laterals can also include bends and transitions that occur as the lateral tries to reach the main line. Lateral pipes are constructed of several different materials such as VCP, ductile iron, cast iron, Orangeburg, or PVC. To quickly take you through the process that a lateral undergoes when it's deteriorating. Basically, shifting earth or erosion causes the deterioration of the joint sealant. This leads to the eventual separation of the joint. Waste, wastewater leaks out into the environment, attracting tree root. This is what we call exfiltration. Roots then work their way deeper into the pipe, essentially destroying the lateral line. The exfiltration that was first le leaking out from the pipe now turns into infiltration leaking back into the pipe and bringing with it the soil cover around the pipe. This causes the pipe to sag and eventually crack and separate at the next joint downstream where the same process occurs all over again. There are many trenches rehabilitation technologies available for laterals in the market today, including but not limited to CIPP lateral spot repairs, which addressed only certain damaged sections of the laterals, CIPP lateral linings, which, uh, which address longer sections of the lateral, CIPP main and lateral connection repair, where you are not only addressing the lateral liner, but also the main to lateral connection, which is a known source of problem in the sewer collection system, chemical grouting, and also pipe bursting. There are various considerations uh, that have to be made when performing lateral rehabilitation. Some of them are changes in line direction or bends in the lateral pipe, wearing pipe diameters within the same lateral pipe, and having access to the lateral pipe itself. The first consideration that you have to keep in mind is the change in line direction or the 45 or 90 degree bends that may occur due to the use of various pipe fittings. Sometimes joints are separated 
because of which the pipe does not retain uniform interior, interior shape and consistent direction. And it also may cause separation between two adjoining pipe sections. Technologies and materials available today are able to overcome these issues very easily. It is the presence of a trained and certified inspector on site which will allow you to know which technology is best suited to your project to address those specific concerns. Also varying diameters within the same pipe. It is a very common practice for a contractor to simply insert the smaller diameter pipe to a certain length into the larger pipe and try to seal the connection by placing mortar around the area where the pi two pipes meet. The transition basically forms an eccentric connection. What happens is the smaller pipe ends up sitting on the invert of the larger pipe. The irregular shape of the resulting pipe presents a lot of issues while conducting rehabilitation. The access point to a lateral pipe is a unique characteristic, basically because this is not a mainline pipe that we are addressing that an easy access can be gained through manholes. Technology today allows us to renew lateral pipes by inserting a resin impregnated tube through a clean out. However, in, the, in this case, the diameter, the location, and the length of the clean out are very important factors. In many areas um, or, or on many properties, an outside clean out is not included in the original construction. We strongly recommend that a lateral access point be created before rehabilitation work is undertaken in that case. As extensively covered by Tim before me, there are standards available for reference when performing lateral rehabilitation. To mention a couple of them, F1216 and F2561. These standards also further go into a lot of detail about the testing that should be, con that should be conducted on the materials and technologies while utilizing them. Once again, having just the presence of a trained and certified inspector ensures that the standards are met on the project. There are various phases of quality assurance on a project. Starting from manufacturing of the product or technology to the pre-installation, the installation phase, and the post-installation phase and beyond. During the manufacturing phase, it is very important that in-house testing is con conducted on the product or technology. It is very highly recommended that the manufacturer have a certification program in place to certify and validate all of their technologies and materials. Quality compliance marks should be placed on materials that have been tested and passed the certification program. Also verified third party testing of the material in an environment similar to that of the project should be readily available for submittal purposes. During the pre-installation phase, it should be ensured that the technology specified meets the project requirements. Pre-installation CCTV inspections should be a must. The LACP course, which is the Lateral Assessment and Certification Program by NASCO, has a lot of information on pre-installation CCTV inspections. On-site inspection and the presence of an inspector on site during these pre-installation surveys are necessary. During the installation itself, it, is, it, it needs to be ensured that the specifications, which are originally based on the mentioned standards, are being adhered to. There should be continuous monitoring of installs through the on-site inspection. It should be ensured that the manufacturer has placed and validated certification marks of inspection on the products themselves. Various organizations such as NASTT and NASCO provide programs and reference manu manuals such as the Good Practice Manual and NASCO's ITCP program which can assist during this process. During the post installation phase, it is highly recommended that we have an on-site inspector. It is also recommended that a post-rehabilitation CCTV inspection in accordance with the guidelines laid down by LACP is, construct, is conducted. Again, very important to analyze post videos that are obtained through post-rehabilitation CCTV inspection. And it is very important that quality, uh, there be a list of quality acceptance criteria. It should be very clear whether a certain rehabilitation um, clears the acceptance criteria or not. Testing requirements are laid down again by the standards. They include lab testing as well as field testing 
um, and have similar requirements for post installation where you can perform air testing and dye testing. It is important that a product or technology being used on site has been qualified and verified by the manufacturer themselves and by a third party. It is important that a quality assurance program be in place on the project site. It is very important that the inspector should have testing data of this selected technology in a similar project environment. And finally, it is important that the inspector himself be trained and certified by a program such as the Inspector Certification and uh, Training Program by NASPO. The benefits of having a trained and certified inspector on site are numerous. A trained inspector naturally brings with them the knowledge of quality control documentation, also the knowledge of product specification and what might be the minimum requirements of the specified technology. They also carry with them the ability to recognize key drivers of success failure and consequently the ability to start or stop a project when one of these drivers is realized. And finally, but most importantly, there is naturally an improved level of quality and quality assurance on, project, on the project during installation itself due to the presence of a trained and certified inspector. From a manufacturer's perspective, it is important for us to have somebody who has been trained and certified on site since it assures that the product or the technology that has been installed is per specification and follows the manufacturer's operation manuals. Further than that, it also assures us that the product that has been installed has, 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 a max, has maximized long-term life potential. It minimizes extra, wo uh, extra work orders due to um, eliminating the need for going back and performing the extra work. And finally, but most importantly, it assures that the owner's expectations on the project are met. That will be all for my presentation today. Thank you very much. Thanks, Zahar. Um, our next speaker will be Jerry Munchmeyer. As mentioned, Jerry serves as the technical director of NASCO. Jerry has an incredible 50 years uh, in the pipeline industry. In the past 30 years, has been involved in development, design, and construction of trenchless technologies. During that whole time, he developed or co-founded many of the things that we use today, uh, the inspector training and certification programs that you've heard about, and you'll hear a little bit more about that, um, the Rehab Zone, which is an international display of pipe rehabilitation technologies, PACP, which is the Pipeline Assessment Certification Program, and he was involved in the initial work that we uh, did with Water Resource Center in, in England, as well as uh, Manhole Assessment Certification Program and the Lateral Assessment Certification Program, MACP and LACP. He's also responsible for uh, the performance specifications uh, for all of this rehabilitation that you can find on the NASCO website. Jerry's a registered engineer in really too many states to mention. He was inducted into the Order of the Engineer in 1989. In addition to serving as a technical director of NASCO, where Jerry is also the principal of Munchmeyer Associates LLC, where he provides training and consultation to the pipeline industry. Jerry? Yeah, thank you, Ted. Um, what I'd like to do is kind of pull this presentation together with uh, some uh, discussions on the inspection requirements for different technologies, the, uh, some of the specification standards that uh, are evolving in the industry, and some training opportunities uh, for the trenchless uh, industry. The, uh, talking about inspection, uh, it typically is required on all trenchless uh, infrastructure work. Uh, it provides the assurance that the product constructed all the right expectations. Train inspector, uh, train inspectors trained and knowledgeable to quality assurance inspect, inspect and test the installation of the product being inspected. Uh, what's important is also that these these in, inspection uh, programs are a standard to the industry. Uh, they need to be the same, uh, whether it's in uh, the west part of the country or the east part of the country or middle America. The, the program should be constant for the technology, no matter where it's located in the country. Uh, and of course, the training itself 
uh, can't just be a, a lecture program. It needs to be a program that's confirmed by a certification test. And it's it's been my experience that uh, when a student takes a test uh, after going through a uh, program, the attention span is significantly higher and the uh, learning curve is significantly higher. Uh, we, we know, for instance, in, in public works inspection, uh, there are requirements. Uh, for those of you who have been in the industry for a while, you know you, that if you're building a bridge or a highway or constructing a new pipeline or using a typical uh, dig and replace technology, there's typically a knowledgeable inspector on the job site. An inspector knows uh, proper backfilling procedures, proper pipe laying procedures, and so on. They're there to verify uh, the material quality that's delivered to the job site, to make sure the right product is delivered and installed, to verify that proper installation or application is performed. Uh, I, can, I can tell you uh, an experience I, I had up in the city of Worcester many years ago where the contractor didn't check his line of grade, and, and before he reached the end of the line, he was coming out at the surface. Well, an inspector out there would have caught that early on and would have, would have uh, prevented that, and actually that's what happened because we did have an inspector on the job site. Uh, and of course, it's also there to test the installed uh, product to make sure that the product that has been installed meets the expectations of the contract specifications. So let's let's talk a little bit about inspection for trenchless rehabilitation. Uh, trenchless rehabilitation or trenchless replacement, and there are th many, many, many different technologies out there. Some are, are totally trenchless, some do require some excavation and actually replace the pipe. Uh, must require quality assurance, must require, uh, require inspection and testing. But specifications need to be clear, and I, I tell my students typically uh, through a training program that the specification is as important as the training itself. The, 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 the requirements in the specification really give the inspector the ability to go out and verify and uh, inspect what's actually being installed. So the things that need to be clearly defined in the specifications are such things as what are the quality controls? What is the engineer's uh, um, uh, you know, program for making sure that these products are installed properly? Uh, it defines the inspector's duties and responsibilities in terms of uh, gathering information and documenting information of what's actually happening in the field. And of course, any of the testing requirements and the interval of testing is something that's typically specified. So without a good specification, it becomes very difficult to inspect any project. And, and uh, as we look at other public works projects, we see that these things are very uh, well defined in the contract. And need also to be defined in a trenchless uh, rehabilitation type contract. So what is needed for trenchless rehabilitation construction? Um, the common uh, approach today is to go more towards the performance-based specifications that are uniform and standard. Uh, we have not achieved that yet as, a, as an uh, overall industry. Uh, we're working towards that direction. It, it, whether a product is being installed in, on the West Coast or the East Coast, the, the general installation specifications should be fairly common. Uh, may vary for some climate conditions and, and uh, moisture conditions and things of that nature, but the general installation should be common to all. The specified standard quality control and quality assurances uh, should be uh, something that's uh, defined as needed for the industry. Specified standard testing of materials and workmanship can be standard. It doesn't, again, matter where in the country it's being tested. The, the procedures uh, will be similar or, or the same. And of course, trained and certified inspectors uh, are needed. Uh, they are becoming uh, more popular. Uh, I'll, I'll explain a little later how many inspectors have been, and have been trained to date. And uh, they're well uh, on their way to uh, uh, inspecting these trenchless projects, and uh, the results, at least what I've seen, the results are significantly improved finished products. Uh, they also need to understand project budgets, including funds for the design and construction inspection, and typically, as Ted started the conversation today, it's been my experience of almost 50 years in the industry of writing specifications, designing projects, and, and constructing projects. The third element, which is important and needs to be included in the budget process for all projects, is the inspection budget. Because uh, the design uh, has, has a price tag to it. The construction has even a larger price tag to it. 
And if it's not inspected properly, then the owner really can't be uh, totally assured that it's been installed as, as required. So the inspector is, is critical, always has been the third component of any construction project, and also needs to be the third component of a uh, trenchless type uh, project. Let's talk a little bit about performance specifications. Um, they typically consist uh, consistent in information about expected product requirements. They, 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 they tend to be more geared towards the end result or the, uh, the quality of the product as opposed to uh, the design uh, specifics that might be outlined in, in the spec, such as a prescriptive specification. So they are more uh, in, intent of leaving the means and methods to the contractor and, and, and uh, focusing on uh, making sure that the end product is delivered correctly. They should be consistent quality strength standards throughout the industry. And that, in other words, one city shouldn't have necessarily different quality standards than another because the technology is common to all. Industry expected standards for product sampling during the construction. That seems to be something that uh, still needs to be unified in terms of how many samples should be taken, how often they should be tested to verify that the product has been installed properly. Standard testing protocols. Um, we have ASTM specifications. They essentially define the protocol. They need to be exercised out in the field. And of course, all of these things then re uh, in the performance specifications uh, provide for a level bidding platform for the contractors, which is, uh, which is kind of important because the contractor knows, has to know up front and needs to know up front what's expected and what he needs to perform out there and what's going to cost him money because it's all about um, you know, doing work but getting paid for it. And that's, that's how the contractor survives. And of course, with well-written uh, performance specifications, with good detailed information, uh, that should also eliminate or reduce claims and extra work orders, which can be uh, quite time-consuming as part of a project. So these are some benefits of, of a detail or, or a uh, standard set of performance specifications for the trenchless uh, rehabilitation industry. Also, the contracts, uh, just a, one, one more key point in contracts is that they need to have measurable uh, quality uh, assurance and quality control requirements. And what do we mean by measurable? Um, visual characteristics. Well, we, we can look at the finished product either through a CCTV tape or visually. We can, we can, we can measure whether it meets me measurable, visible or me visible measurable requirements. Physical properties. Uh, most uh, trenchless technology specifications do uh, define what the physical properties of the end product should be. Well, if it's uh, specified and it's in the contract document and it's measure measurable, then the inspector has, needs to have the ability to measure it so that it can be uh, uh, confirmed that the product has been installed correctly. Leakage characteristics after rehabilitation is very specifically defined in the ASTMs, and the inspector has the ability to uh, perform uh, supervised testing and have the contractor perform testing and verify that those requirements are met. And then anything else that the engineer feels needs to be measurable that uh, will define the end product quality then also should be contained in these specifications. So inspection for trenches technologies will vary for different technologies. And I'd like to just go through some of them and give you some, some talking points on what, what we look for for different products. We have, for instance, the cured in place pipe product. It's called CIPP. It's a resin and fabricated tube that is uh, uh, combined in a, usually in a factory setting and then brought out to the field and uh, in, installed. And then it's uh, either cured using either heat or light, so there are multiple different methods of doing it. And in essence, the product is, is, uh, is fabricated off-site, but then brought to the site and cured actually in place, or manufactured in the field. So some things that we look for, uh, and for an inspector to, to, to be able to verify that they're getting the quality, they're getting the potential long-term expected life of 50 years plus, and by the way, in this particular product, the first liner that uh, was installed was in 1971. So there's about a 42-year history, 
which um, which tells me that 50-year life is not unusual for this type of product, provided uh, it's inspected and it's installed properly. So things that we would look for for a cured-in-place pipe would be uh, what types of resins are being used, because the concept here is simple. The resin is the finished product pipe. The tube that usually the resin is delivered uh, into the pipe with is simply a, an installation mechanism, unless it contains a reinforcing. But your typical felt tubes are simply a mechanism for placing the resin into the pipe. So the resin quantity is also key. The, 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 the correct quantity will essentially assure a long-term product. Less quantity uh, may present an inferior product that may not last for the same period of time. So the inspector needs to be able to check that. And through training, they have the ability to do that. Condition of the existing pipe. The inspector needs to know, uh, is it clean? Has it been cleaned properly? Is there something that has fallen into the pipe before the liner is installed? Needs to be able to verify that the line has been cleaned is free and clear of any obstructions that, that will prevent the installation of the liner and then uh, uh, have the contractor installed accordingly. And then, of course, there's the, once it's installed, it, it isn't yet manufactured, it isn't yet cured, it's still a wet resin liner, it then has to go through the curing process of, of actually heating the liner or applying heat and then uh, bringing it to a recommended temperature and then allowing it to cool back down uh, when it becomes hard and cooling it back down to a pipe within a pipe. These are things that the inspector needs to be aware of and needs to be able to verify out in the field that they, they are being done correctly. Uh, and then, of course, the finish work. The, the line of terminations at the manholes need to be properly finished and at, at service uh, pipeline reconnections. Uh, I tell my students occasionally, you know, it's it's terrible when you see a great project installed and then it looks like a rat came in and shoot the connections open. So it's it's important that that's the last piece of quality that, that is checked by the inspector and to verify that the finished product is delivered. So let's talk a little bit about some other products that are out there. We've got folded pipe technology. Uh, this is a product that's actually manufactured in a factory. It's uh, delivered out to the project, usually in a deformed configuration to make it smaller in cross-section. Uh, that allows it to be uh, uh, placed onto a coil and then, uh, or a, uh, a coil section of pipe and then delivered to the project. You can see from the slide, the bottom slide, the, the product is usually deformed into a uh, into it could be a U shape, a C shape, a flat shape. In any event, the smaller configuration allows it to be pulled into an existing pipe, then using uh, heat or light. And in this particular case, with the folded technology, it's primarily heat. They use a uh, pressure and steam, and the pipe is re-rounded back into a round configuration and then processed. But there's key things the inspector needs to know. It's just not a matter of, oh, this looks pretty. They need to know, make sure the correct material. There are PVCs, there, there are polyethylene products out there. They have different ways of processing. They are, they are heated to different temperatures. They have to be brought up to a specific temperature so that they will stay in place properly. Uh, the manufacturer certification is important that the product has been in, uh, uh, manufactured to certain standard specifications. Uh, again, common to all of the lining type technologies, the condition of the existing pipe becomes very important for the inspector to verify and uh, observe and look at before the pipe liner is installed. Required material processing. In this particular case, the approach is not curing the pipe in place, but it's reprocessing it from a, from a, uh, a smaller configuration or cross-section back into a round pipe. And then, of course, the finish work, uh, which is true for most technologies, is the reopening of the services to the, uh, to the homes and how that's done and how that is left in a good workmanship manner. All things the inspector needs to record, needs to be knowledgeable of, of when these uh, products are being installed. <clears throat> we have pipe bursting, which is essentially a replacement technology, also very, very common in the industry. Uh, it's considered trenchless technology, even though there's some excavation required. But there's some things such as technology limits. Um, there's uh, sometimes a uh, misunderstanding of how, uh, how big a pipe can be installed to replace the existing pipe. 
Uh, the key with this technology, of course, is that can, the pipe can not only be uh, just replaced, but it can replace, be replaced with a larger size. And of course, there's some limitations to that, and of course, that's part of the training program to teach the inspector just what are the limitations and what works and what doesn't work. Types of pipe to be installed. We have a choice of pipes today. Anything from polyethylene to uh, p different types of PVC to ductile iron pipe to FRP pipe can be installed using this type of technology. So lots of choices for the owner, lots of choices for the engineer, but again, how they install, how they joint it, how, how, the, how should they be inspected out in the field. Also, the excavation requirements. We all understand polyethylene. We all understand PVC. We know polyethylene is a very flexible product, whereas uh, PVC is much more of a rigid product in its cold state. Well, the excavation requirements will be directly related to the bending radius of these materials. So that's something the inspector needs to understand. And any other acceptance criteria, such as air testing or visual acceptance, that is important when installing a product or a trenchless product using this particular technology. So you can see that each of the technologies will, will have some different things that you need to look at. Some have some, common, some commonalities, but others have a completely different list of inspection criteria. So uh, let's, uh, let's look at the next one, which is, uh, which is slip lining. Slip lining has been around for, for many, many years. It's probably one of the oldest technologies uh, that, that we know as, as we look at as trenchless. However, it is a technology where uh, it requires that a smaller pipe be installed into the existing larger pipe. Uh, it usually has an annular space. Uh, there are a number of different uh, techniques. Uh, there can be continuous slip lining where a complete uh, five, 600 feet of pipe are welded together or fused together or jointed together and can be pulled into an existing line. Uh, several thousand feet is not uncommon if it's a straight configuration to be able to do a slip lining type technology. Uh, such things as bending radius, however, and joint characteristics of the type of pipe, whether it's polyethylene or PVC is important. Grout volume calculations are, are super important in terms of defining if the product needs to be grouted. Remember, we're putting in a pipe that's smaller than the host pipe. In some cases, the engineer will require that the annular space be grouted. So those are things the inspector needs to be aware of so they can determine whether or not the contract is grouting it properly and performing the work as specified. And then how to quality assure and test the installed product. So, like I said, there are a number of different ways. The most common are continuous slip lining and uh, segmental slip lining, which is uh, uh, where sections of pipe are uh, usually 20 feet in length are, are inserted into, into an excavation or where the pipe has been opened up, the sections are inserted and then floated uh, using the existing flow stream, floated into the existing pipe and therefore providing a new pipe within the existing pipe. But in all cases, Slip lining is where a smaller pipe is inserted into a larger pipe, as opposed to lining techniques where uh, we, we put a close fitting type of uh, lining system in, which uh, returns significantly more uh, pipe capacity uh, after the product has been rehabilitated. Uh, last one is, is inspection of manhole rehabilitation. Uh, obviously, we, we've talked about all the different ones, and we're still going to talk about laterals a little bit. But, but you know, we, we, we're inspecting the entire uh, collection system here is, is basically what we're saying. The main line is important. The laterals are becoming very important. Of course, the manhole is the third component that also has a number of different rehabilitation technologies that require inspection. Uh, manholes differ somewhat because uh, manholes are multi-component, yeah, whereas a, a pipe is a pipe, whereas manholes have castings, they have rises, they have chimneys, they have walls, they have benches. So it requires a, a little different approach uh, for rehabilitation. However, the inspector needs to be uh, aware of things, needs to be aware that the correct product is being uh, installed. Uh, there are many, many different products out there. Some of them look, look alike, some of them smell the same, 
Some of them feel the same. Uh, it's, it's important to understand that the correct product for the, for the particular application needs to be verified. The engineer will typically approve it, but the inspector needs to be able to understand what he's looking at and is, is it the right product for the application that's been specified. What the product capabilities are and compatibilities. Uh, what we find in, in manhole rehabilitation, multiple product use. Uh, such as using a, a cementitious base coat with a polymer top coat, uh, the compatibility of materials becomes very, very important. I'll give you an example. Early on, um, when I was involved in, in uh, lining manholes uh, with a, with a, with a, uh, a spray-on product, uh, one of my applicators, um, new into the business, never had done it before, needed a patching material in the manhole, um, didn't have any, so we went to Home Depot and got some off-the-shelf patching material and used it on the manhole and then went ahead and, and put top-coated it. And of course, it didn't work. The coating ended up peeling off and, and uh, the, 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 uh, the cause of it was that the two materials were not compatible. And so it's important that the inspector knows what materials are compatible. The inspector needs to understand, for instance, what the preparation requirements are. For any material to bond or mechanically bond to a structure, the, the three most important things that I always tell people are preparation, preparation, preparation. Because if it's not prepared properly and there's loose material or the deteriorated material remaining on the whole structure, when the uh, application is, is, uh, of the material is applied, then that will ultimately fail, and then subsequently the whole product will fail. So uh, these are things that the inspector needs to know. Uh, the product application requirements, how is the product mixed, uh, how is it applied, uh, to what thickness is it applied, um, and it varies from product to product. Testing protocol, uh, how, do, how do we test these products? Uh, there are some very, very common tests. There's a test called a spark test, uh, or a, uh, uh, which basically tests if there's any pinholes or voids in the coating. It'll send an electrical spark from the main structure through that hole, and it'll appear, it'll, it'll be a sound effect. It'll actually a spark occurring. And so that the contractor and the inspector will know, yeah, it's, you know, we've got a pinhole. We have something we, we you know, we have to repair to make the job complete. It's also important to know how, these, how these, uh, this apparatus works, how, you try, how it's turned on, how it's properly grounded, uh, so that when the inspection is ongoing, the inspector fully knows that he's getting a valid test. Adhesion testing is another test that's very common in this industry where the uh, product, uh, a small section of the product is, uh, is pulled off the wall to determine how well has it bonded to the wall. This is also has some very specific protocol, and the inspector is, is trained in, in how these things are done, and so that when he's out on the project site, he knows that they're being done correctly, and he can verify that the product has been installed correctly. And then, of course, those testing protocols may vary from uh, for different products. In the uh, in the manhole industry, we've got anything from cured in place manhole liners to uh, polymer spray on to cementitious, to sheet liners, to composite hand laid up systems, and more. So the inspector needs to be familiar with each of those so that when he's out on a project site, he knows exactly what to look for during his inspection. Laterals, um, Zahar already talked a little bit about the laterals and the importance of, of the lateral inspections. Laterals uh, typically are, are categorized as a pipe but uh, and some of the uh, the inspection criteria for pipe is is is, is similar. Uh, your cured in place type systems obviously fall, fall within about the same protocol. Your pipe bursting replacement projects have have other uh, inspection requirements. But in all cases, uh, it is important to understand uh, for the inspector to be able to verify that the product that was approved that was submitted by the contractor is actually being installed in the field. Uh, in the case of cured in place, uh, correct resin. Uh, in the case of pipe bursting, the correct material and the quantity that was specified needs to be able to be verified by the inspector. 
skin condition of existing pipe uh, is similar to the other technologies. It's important to understand that the pipe has been prepared properly before the product is installed, and the inspector needs to know that. Uh, processing or curing of the product is, in, is something the inspector needs to verify out there, and of course, your correct uh, line of terminations and long-term sealing mechanisms, if required for uh, infiltration control uh, at the junction of the laterals and the main line, is, is, is extremely important to be able to verify that the, the product being installed will meet the requirements of the contract specifications. And then, of course, the proper testing uh, of each of the applications, whether it's the, it's the casting or whether it's the chimney or whether it's the bench, these are uh, things the inspector needs to understand uh, when he's out on a job site, needs to be able to know what to look for out there. So let's, let's look a little bit about some examples of project, uh, projects with no inspection. And, and as technical director of NASCO, I, I get a lot of feedback from different people in the industry uh, on, on project results out there. And uh, usually, uh, when there's an issue of some sort, it's, uh, it's uh, a lot of times we can tie it back to there was no inspection on the job site. And so when, when example of a product with no inspection, the product does not meet the owner's expectations. Here's an example of a CIPP liner that, where that was, the resin quantities were less than required. It, it, uh, it resulted in a porous pipe. Uh, the uh, material uh, had a chance to uh, migrate through the wall of the pipe and stain uh, the pipe between the coating and the, and the uh, resin. Uh, some testing uh, basically uh, resulted in, in uh, verifying that. Uh, here's an example of a liner where the resin was uh, not sufficient in the liner, and the owner, after installation, uh, went in with a high-pressure jet cleaning equipment and was able to peel out a significant quantity of uh, this top layer of the CIPP liner. Again, after inspection, uh, we determined that th there was not sufficient amount of resin in the liner to be able to uh, knit or totally saturate the tube into a homogeneous pipe. Uh, these are things, if the inspector can check these things beforehand, will prevent these uh, things from happening later in the, in the process. Folds and uh, wrinkles in pipes can happen, particularly with the CIPP lining technology. Uh, we teach inspectors basically what's important, uh, what's a blemish, what's something that will disrupt the flow. And so he has the, the tools and the knowledge to be able to determine that when he's out in the field. Uh, use of tools out in the field um, that are used for, for instance, opening up a service connection. There are correct tools. There are finished quality requirements that are typically contained in the specifications. And so the inspector will know immediately when he sees something like this, it's not properly, uh, properly cut and it doesn't meet the product specifications and he again can go back to the contractor either for a repair or, or an adjustment on, the, on this particular uh, uh, item. Another example of what happens when a pipe is somewhat undersized or maybe uh, very, in many cases, um, you know, we all have to recognize something that uh, with all of these trenches technologies, we are not replacing or lining new pipe. We're, we're lining old pipe that's this, this form that are, that's partially collapsed. And so in some cases, uh, some anomalies may happen as a result. Because the last one is, is, a, is a slip lining uh, project where the grouting pressures were too high, uh, which they had the inspector uh, been knowledgeable of that, this would not have happened where the uh, grouting pressure was sufficiently high that it actually collapsed the pipe that was slip lined into the host pipe. So just some things the inspector really needs to know out there. Some projects, example projects uh, where the owner's expectations are met. Uh, usually the inspector has the ability to uh, inspect the materials inspect in the case of a cured in place liner, inspect the tube, make sure that it's uh, uh, fabricated to standard. The resins are uh, critical. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of resins out there. 
Um, the correct resin it should be a resin that's specific for that project, which is a sewer resin that's specially designed for sewer applications. Uh, those things can be tested. Those things can be approved. And the inspector needs to know uh, a way to properly make sure that those resins are being supplied. The resin installation or the liner installation and how it works is something that the inspector needs to understand. And if all of the uh, uh, pieces of the installation process, the manufacturer and the resin and the installation, go pretty well as recommended by the manufacturer, the finished product is usually a consistent, um, you know, well-cured product. Uh, service connections as well. Um, you know, they're, they're again, uh, rather than having a, a rat coming in and, and chewing those connections out, they should be smooth. Uh, they should uh, follow the configuration of the service connection. And of course, this is something the inspector is trained in so that he knows what to expect and what is, uh, what, what is achievable in the industry and what they do not need to accept as per standard. So some inspection requirement standards uh, that uh, we can talk about. Uh, municipal and utility and all this must require trained and certified inspectors. So it's a requirement that unless it's specified, it's probably not going to happen out there. Many cities today and many utility owners uh, actually require that a trained inspector of a specific technology be out on a job site. Performance specifications must define what the product, project quality is expected. So once that's defined, then the contractor needs to deliver that quality. That's his means and methods, and that's his ability to, 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 to provide that. The inspector's uh, uh, quality assurance, inspection protocol, and testing requirements need to be standard in the specifications and need to be standard for all products, whether it's pipe bursting, whether it's CIPP or folded technology, needs to be industry standard. And that's, that's where the industry is going. Uh, quality standards must be consistently verified and inspected. So what I'm saying basically, one city uh, should be, uh, all cities should be, all customers should be uh, following a consistent quality standard program of inspection, verifying that they're getting the final product in a, in a consistent manner. There are some training programs out there that are available to the industry, and uh, they're, they're quite different, actually. Um, I recently uh, looked at this, the American Public Works Association one, and that is a, uh, it is a certification public, uh, it, it's called a certification public infrastructure inspector, so it's a CPII program. Uh, the training itself, there is no training associated with it, so there's no educational training, but the inspector uh, that is experienced and has, I believe it's a minimum of about four or five years of experience, can uh, apply to take the test and get certified. But it is the inspector's knowledge, uh, general knowledge of inspection uh, across all public works uh, products that he then needs to bring to the examination, much like uh, if anybody's ever taken a contractor's exam, uh, you do your own study and then you go take the exam, and if you pass the exam, then you get certified as a, as a contractor. Same with the Public Works program. It's a certification testing program only to test that an inspector has the general knowledge required for Public Works inspection. And it is a broad, a broad training program for all different types of work. The inspector training program that NASCO has, has, uh, has prepared over the last several years there are two that are out in the industry today. Is a third that's being developed. The the, uh, the most common one is the cured in place uh, uh, program. There's over a thousand inspectors that that are, are trained in the industry today. The uh, the uh, many many of the agencies and cities required as a standard in their specifications now uh, that they train inspector be on the job site. The second program is the inspector training and certification program for manhole rehabilitation. Uh, several years ago, the industry said to us, look, you know, uh, cured in place, that's fine, that takes care of the main line, but you know, we have a lot of problems in manhole rehabilitation as well. So we need to really get inspectors out there that are trained, that are knowledgeable of all of these products. So that training program was developed and is available to the industry. Some quick things uh, that is included, each includes 13.5 uh, uh, hours of education and training. 
so it's not only a certification, but it's also the training for the certification that's included in the program. So uh, after the training, then of course the certification uh, is uh, is uh, determined through examination uh, for each of the inspectors. Some quick overview uh, of what's included in these programs. Chapter one of the CIPP program just talks about existing conditions and where the product applies and where additional work might be necessary before the product should actually be applied. And there are standards. Uh, ASTM F1216 has some basic standards which say basically uh, when a line has uh, has uh, come down or, or overlies more than 10%, it needs to be designed specially, and it's just not just an off-shelf design. If volume of more than 40% is lost, then the product is considered collapsed, and a special design approach needs to be uh, applied for that particular uh, uh, application. Chapter 2 talks about the CIPP technology, all of the different aspects that go into producing a pipe from uh, materials to the resins to how it's wet out and how important the wet out is in terms of getting the right volume of resin applied, how it's installed in the field, and what the end product should consist of. These are all things the inspector becomes knowledgeable of uh, and can use that information in the field. Chapter 3 talks about the uh, field installation, and uh, it actually goes and trains the inspector through all aspects of what happens on the field, from uh, cleaning of the pipe to uh, taking samples, sample pieces uh, for testing purposes, uh, installation procedures, and of course how the connections are, uh, service connections are reopened after the lining. Chapter 4 um, really goes through the, uh, ties in the specification requirements uh, for an inspector to be able to do proper inspections. It uh, reviews not how to write a specification so much as what are the important aspects of a specification that give the contractor a full understanding of what needs to be done and also the uh, inspector on what needs to be inspected. The uh, last chapter of the uh, CIPP program is, uh, is a program that goes through other technologies. This is a popular chapter that, that uh, most of the students uh, really enjoy. It's, it talks about other technologies, of which we've talked a little bit about already, the pipe bursting, the fold of pipe technology, and how they compare uh, to the CIPP technology. The, uh, uh, manhole rehabilitation program is uh, is kind of set up in in a similar format. It has five chapters. Uh, the first chapter is a uh, again we talk about defects in manholes. Of course, we talk about uh, defects in multiple components now, not just a pipe. We talk about defects in in such as covers and and, and chimneys and and walls and and cracks in pipes and. And of course, the language in all of these programs is a standard, uh, what we call PACP standard language, which is used throughout all of the programs that NASCO uh, develops and presents to the industry. So the first chapter, again, talks about uh, existing conditions and what type of uh, uh, rehabilitation technologies are applicable. The second chapter is uh, pretty detailed on the uh, manhole preparation the quality assurance and testing required, and goes very much in detail on on spark testing and adhesion testing and uh, wet film thickness testing and and uh, the pH testing and things of that nature. He, the inspector, when when he after he goes through chapter two, pretty well knows what all of the test requirements and all the test methods uh, are and is is uh, knowledgeable. Plus, he has a manual that will discuss each of these uh, items in detail that he can refer back to. Chapter 3 and 4 go through different manhole replacement and rehabilitation technologies. Anything from slipping a pipe uh, with a pre-formed uh, FRP insertion uh, technology to spraying technologies to spin casting technologies and uh, putting in a uh, cured-in-place type uh, system. Uh, there are a multitude of different technologies, and within each category, there are a multitude of products out there. And we, we discuss uh, and we train the inspector on the major key elements that are out there in the job 
uh, primarily by, uh, for instance, in, in the spray-on that, that's considered a polymer spray-on system. Uh, that can include such things as poly, uh, um, uh, polyurethanes, epoxies, polyureas. We, we talk about all of those different products. Chapter 5 is, again, uh, ties in the, the, the importance of specifications and how they, uh, how they provide the inspector the ability and, uh, to, to define what needs to be inspected, what needs to be tested, and to what interval things need to be tested out in the, on the project site. Uh, NASCO certification testing is typically uh, a 70-question uh, test. The student needs to rec uh, acquire an 85% for passing. Uh, what we typically do with this is if a student doesn't pass, uh, then uh, they're allowed to, uh, for free of charge, to come to another training session and take the, take the program over again. The whole focus with the NASCO program is we want the inspector to be as knowledgeable as possible when he's out there on the job site uh, and inspecting these projects. So in summary, uh, training and certified inspector is a factor, not the only factor, but it is a key factor uh, in the contractor achieving a successful, quality assured, and tested rehabilitation project that meets expectations of the owner. Uh, so that uh, kind of concludes uh, my part of it. I'll turn it back to Ted. Uh, Ted, you're going to um, get into some questions and answers. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Jerry. Uh, we do have time for questions, and I want to just say, tell everyone, I appreciate all the questions that we got. We've gotten a lot of questions uh, over this, and um, I'm going to kind of direct them to the, the panelists if I can, but I'm going to ask if we can kind of be a little bit concise on them, because, again, we have a lot of questions. We want to hit as many as we can. Uh, what we don't hit, we'll try, what we'll try to do is put together something with a Q&A um, on all these questions, but they're really some good ones. I'm going to kind of go uh, backwards right now, because um, the, the last one uh, asked, are there any standard specifications for various types of trenchless rehab methods discussed today? Um, that's kind of what NASCO does. Um, we do a lot of these uh, speci performance specifications that we want to, you know, want people to actually use. We want engineers to download and, and use and modify and make their own because that's kind of what we feel is the best starting point for, for a lot of these. So if you look on the NASCO website, go under um, uh, the specifications tab, uh, you'll find those specifications. And they're, they're actually, um, they're, we don't charge for uh, um, non-members, but uh, we do have Word files. They're PDFs. There's Word files for members. The other question, probably have started with this. What is NASCO? NASCO is actually a, a trade association. It's the National Association of Sewer Service Companies. And without getting into a lot of it, uh, but we, we are made up of contractors, engineers, and municipalities, as well as educational uh, uh, facilities that, um, you know, th this is what we do. We really focus on trenches technology. So I, I encourage you to look at the NASCO website. Uh, www.nasco.org. Um, and let me kind of go back. And Tim, I think this one was directed uh, towards you. Uh, what kind of, and maybe Jerry, what kind of test instrument is used to verify cement liner thickness in manholes? Uh, there's a couple of different ones. Uh, one in particular, sometimes people use a small diameter metal wire like a you know, a little smaller than a coat hanger, and they can stick that in there, pull it out, and see what the thickness is. Um, it doesn't leave too big a hole, so a trowel, uh, a trowel back over that can uh, can close up the hole. Um, there are some ultra uh, sonic thickness testers, non-destructive type testers, uh, maybe after the product is cured. But uh, you know, really, just the inspector being out there on site verifying how much cement is going in on the walls is another uh, tell of, of how much is on there. Yeah, I agree. Hey, I, I think I, I think those are the two key methods. The, the thin wire seems to be uh, a, a way of testing it in its wet while it's still wet. And uh, so if there's additional material that needs to be added, uh, that's a quick way of, of checking that. And the ultrasonic 
is something that's used ex extensively in manholes uh, after the product has cured and uh, the ultrasonic will will be able to uh, give back information on the thickness at different level at different areas in the manhole. Okay, thanks Tim and Jerry. Uh, next question, does NASCO have a post lining inspection form to use during QC reviews of the post lining videos? If not, what do they recommend to track and report defects in the new liner? And again, that's directed at either Tim or Jerry, I think. Well, uh, we don't we don't have a uh, a specifically entitled a uh, post uh, installation inspection form. Uh, what we have in the training course in Chapter Three for the particularly for the CIPP program, we have inspector documentation forms throughout the uh, throughout the presentation for all different aspects of the program. Now, some students will take those forms. And they will, uh, you know, consolidate them into one form or one major form or comprehensive form. Other cities have uh, gone to electronic documentation, so they take those forms and they put it on a tablet. And as they as they uh, go through the inspection process, each of that little information, each of those points are uh, are recorded, and it goes into a central data bank at the end of the day. Uh, there, are, there's not a specific you know, well, like I say, each each inspection, a key inspection point, there is a form that we recommend or we illustrate in the training program. Uh, we provide that electronically to our students so they can they can make up with our, take those base forms and make up with other what whatever forms they need for their particular project. Jerry, can I ask you to comment a little bit more on those forms? Because another question was, you know, do we have those forms? And you just mentioned for each phase of the project. Can you comment well, a little bit more on the forms that we offer? The yeah, the the forms uh, each inspection phase, whether it's uh, reviewing the um, the uh, setup of bypass pumping or reviewing traffic control, every aspect of the project has an illustrative form of what the co what the inspector should be documenting. Usually these forms are prepared ahead of time by the inspector based on the quality controls that are required in the contract. The quality controls are listed on the form and then the inspector basically a quality assures out in the field to make sure those things are done. It includes things like uh, delivery of materials, uh, includes uh, cleaning of the pipe. It includes every aspect of the installation process. Those forms are provided to the inspector uh, that goes through the training program. Uh, it's in the manual. It's illustrated in the manual, and it's discussed during the training program. And there is typically a hard copy of that form in the appendices. And then we offer anyone that wants to use those forms as a base to make their own form we offer to send them an electronic version of each of the forms that they can, can then consolidate and perhaps uh, combine several forms to meet their specific requirements. Okay, th thanks, Jerry. And then just a brief comment on the the video. One thing we do kind of profess is we do have the you know the the PACP program and the MACP and LACP program, and during the training for those we do. Uh, look at post rehabilitation inspection, uh, you know that being used for post rehabilitation inspection. So that would be, uh, you know, partially an answer to that question. Um, another question: uh, Is there any specific testing methods? I think I think we answered this a little bit. Um, for trenchless pipes, i.e., testing methods vary with size of pipe and trenchless methods. Uh, can uh, one of you comment on that? Well. Yeah, I'll, I'll, this is Jerry, I'll, I'll comment on that. Um, the testing method itself uh, will, will be common pretty much to, uh, to the material. The, uh, the method of taking samples will vary. Uh, for instance, in the cured in place technology, for smaller diameter uh, pipe installations, the uh, usual recommended approach is to have the contractor provide a uh, piece of PVC pipe. I used to have a, a steel pipe that I had, uh, like a clamshell clamp, uh, 
uh, depends on the contractor. And, and the, what the contractor does basically on pipes that are 18 inches or smaller, and the reason the 18 inches is because the manhole casting opening can only accommodate up to a certain size to be able to put a pipe into the manhole. And when the contractor actually installs a liner, he then lines through this piece of PVC or sample uh, uh, mechanism. And that then becomes the product that once the, uh, a product, the liner is cured, that is removed, that is then sent to the laboratory for testing. In larger diameter pipes, same material, the uh, samples are taken using what we call flat plate samples. This is where the, the wet out technician at the factory that, that is wetting out the, the, the tube will take a piece of the wet liner and will clamp it in between two steel plates, securing it, putting it into a plastic uh, sealed container, uh, putting it in, uh, shipping it with the liner. The contractor will then hang that into the uh, flow stream either at the upstream side or in the steam, in a steam box at the downstream side. So it's, it's a variation of how the samples are taken. Uh, the actual testing, still the samples then go to a laboratory. The laboratory will machine those samples into a specific size configuration for testing, and then they will test the materials. So it's, it's a common testing procedure. It's either ASTM 790, uh, for flexural testing or ASTM 638 for, for tensile testing. Uh, it's just merely, it's a different approach of getting the sample from the installed pipe. If the larger ones are from plate samples, anything less than 18 inches is going to be from a, what we call a restrained sample in a like diameter pipe that's installed and then lined through. That pretty well cover it? Yeah, thanks, Jerry. Um, we, we, we got a comment, and I think it's worth uh, um, putting out there, that says that please emphasize post-inspection database, not just the po uh, post-inspection videos. And, and particularly, this is, this is true for the large, larger municipalities with a lot, a lot of assets. Um, it's a lot of what Jerry just spoke about in terms of the, uh, the reports that get done on every phase of the, uh, of the project. To make sure that there's a record of them, not you know, not just the videos. The videos obviously are important, but they're they're really one aspect. Um, gonna skip down a little bit. Uh, question for Sahar: uh, You mentioned about testing samples from lined laterals. How do you sample a lined lateral? Um, to be honest with you, testing. Um a lined lateral um, can be difficult, especially when you are trying to conduct non-destructive testing. Uh, there are various methods uh, that are employed. Um, I, the, the two that I can recall from off the top of my head are air testing, where the entire system is pressurized, and um, they look to see where the air is escaping from. And s similar, on along the same lines, we have dye testing, uh, wherein the system is flooded uh, with some sort of a colored um, dye or water, uh, and again, it is inspected for leakages um, or separations in the lining or uh, things like that. Also, uh, testing uh, to a large extent for lined laterals in, includes post-video analysis, where you are actually looking at uh, the CCTV inspection recording of a lined lateral and studying it for uh, defects in the lining, uh, places where the liner has buckled, if that ever happens, or, or wrinkles and issues such, such as that. OK, thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. um, next question, and I think this was towards Tim. Uh, how does an on-site inspector verify resin thickness on CIPP when it has been wet out and shipped to the site? I guess I can go to either uh, Tim or, or well, l l let me let me respond to that. Okay, um, resin thickness. Uh, typically, uh, we 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 don't measure resin thickness when the liner is delivered to the job site. We we measure resin volume. Uh, just a little background. Resin, as I said earlier, the resin makes up the pipe. 
the uh, liner itself is a vehicle for being able to install resin into a pipeline in a uniform configuration and then allowing us to cure that resin. So the resin is the key to, to the uh, structure of the pipe and the thickness of the pipe. And so what we do, it's a two-part uh, approach. We obviously, uh, the first part is to check the resin volume. They, uh, there is a engineered, um, uh, basically, uh, requirement that a certain tube size, a certain thickness, uh, there's a certain amount of air in that tube. That air has to be taken out and replaced with resin, and there can be only so much resin that can be inserted into a tube. And that volume, typically, as an industry standard, by volume is 85% resin and 15% tube volume. So those are the kinds of things that we check, and the inspector checks when the liner gets uh, delivered to the project site. They typically will have uh, saturation charts that are uh, prepared and produced by the resin manufacturers that say basically how many pounds per resin per foot a liner should have uh, to meet uh, design requirements. Um, the thickness uh, uh, question comes after the cure, after the liner has been installed and the sample has been removed. In the case of restrained samples, the laboratory will come back and measure that restrained sample. Uh, the protocol calls for measuring it at eight different locations, and they will come back what the average measurement is, and then the, uh, the engineer or the inspector will get that test result back, and that says, yes, this is uh, a liner that's six millimeters or seven millimeters, or whatever the thickness measured, this is what we measured in the laboratory. So there's two, two phases. We make sure that the inspector knows how to check the resin content initially, and then uh, the, uh, the testing for the thickness is done after the liner has been cured. Okay, thanks, Jerry. Um, next question I'm going to put on uh, Tim, our, our new uh, chair of the Manhole Rehab um, Committee, is, is there a manhole CIP standard in the works? And C manhole CIP is addressed in the current manhole uh, performance specifications, but I think, Tim, can you comment on updating that? Uh, there is a couple of standards that are being proposed. There are work items right now within ASTM, uh, two of them that I know of for, uh, for cured in place manholes. Um, I think one's a little bit further along than the other, um, but that's, uh, you know, that's going to help things. Right now, there's, as far as I know, for, for manhole rehab, there's only one ASTM standard, and that's for cementitious spray-on or trowel-on lining. And, uh, you know, encourage others to, you know, we, we need more standards out there for, for manhole rehab. Yeah, just to add to that, in the cured in place uh, uh, technology, there are two basic techniques out there. One is a, uh, a pre-measured, uh, close-fitting uh, uh, liner that's fabricated to meet the configuration of the existing manhole, and then it's installed with pressure and held up against the wall. The other technique is more of a uh, one size fits multiple uh, sizes, and it's a stretchable material that's inflated and, and pressurized, and it uh, it kind of conforms to the existing uh, manhole. And, and so those are two of the key ones that I'm seeing in the industry. And I agree with Tim, each one of those, there's some ASTM standards in the works, uh, but they, it's going to be some time before they're out there, uh, you know, for the industry to use. Okay, thanks, uh, Jerry and Tim. Tim, there's another question for you, and this has been one that I've seen um, several times before, you addressed longer warranty. Does this tie up the contractor's bond and affect ability to bid future jobs? Uh, how can you assure a contractor will fix problems or issues, and I would assume within some sort of a uh, longer extended warranty? Can you comment on that? Uh, yes. The, the, that is a concern as an engineer writing specs to extend the warranty. Does it affect the contractor's bonding limitations or, or aggregate? And the answer is, I believe it does in most cases. However, there are some contractors that have found some uh, unique ways with specific verbiage, I guess, within uh, 
to, to not affect their bonding uh, capabilities. Um, so that is something that the contractor needs to explore with the bonding companies because I believe the trend is more and more to require longer warranties on projects with uh, manhole rehab guys offering 10-year warranties and uh, lateral guys, connection finder guys. Well, yeah, let me comment on that. If I can, I'll add to that, Tim, is that uh, warranty is, is a controversial subject in the industry. Uh, the standard, as we know, in the industry for construction is one year. Um, we'll see two years, three years in some cases. Uh, the, uh, the, the, you know, the, the correct uh, warranty is usually backed by an insurance company. So it's really up to the insurance company uh, to uh, determine what their comfort level is and, and what length of time they're willing to stand behind a particular product. It, it's, it's been my feeling, and uh, I know a lot of people don't agree necessarily, but the warrant, we, 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 we really need to, um, by, by, by promoting inspection on the job site and having a qualified inspector out there, we should be reasonably assured that um, that at the end of the project, before we accept it and the contract gets its payment, that we have tested and we have verified and inspected and, and have a pretty good idea the uh, the project has been installed properly. Uh, I, I'm always an advocate. I think most of the products out in the industry are pretty well bulletproof. They're they're good products. The variable is really uh, what happens on the field and how is it installed and. and that's where the inspector really plays a major role. So uh, there is there is some some uh, engineers that are promoting a longer term, but we also know by different products. We know, for instance, a CFPP liner, if it checks out and it looks good and there's no defects in it and there's not no nothing permeating through the wall and no staining. And it's you know. We know we got a pretty good product, and we could look at it a year from now, two years from now, five years from now, and it's probably not going to change dramatically. On the other hand, coatings are a different issue for manholes. We know, for instance, that coatings may, many times are left behind with thin holes and, and some other minor defects that are not easily discernible by the human eye. And when that happens, and the coating starts to deteriorate, unless it's inspected and unless it's uh, properly prepared as soon as possible, that coating will ultimately totally fail. So, so we know some of these things. So the inspection uh, requirements typically can be adjusted, or the warranty periods can typically adjusted for the different types of technologies to account for that. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll comment on the follow-up inspections are very key. A lot of times the yes. warranties do offer bigger warranties, or the contractors offer bigger warranties in hopes that, hey, they're never going to go look at them anyway. So that's an important right. uh, part of the, the whole warranty picture um, in, in playing the game of longer warranties is yeah, cities need to you know make sure we have follow-up inspections. Has to be inspected. Has to be inspected. That's it's gotta be standard standard procedure. Not not necessarily the entire project. Could be a percentage and, and then based on that percentage would it, would we determine how how good or bad the project is and, and will will lead to either more or, or no further inspection. And that's that's one reason why we're here is to make sure you know the specifications are written right, right and the uh, job is well inspected. I'm going to change gears here a little bit because this is kind of a more broad but pretty pertinent question. We keep hearing lining does not solve I and I issues. Is this true? And can one of you comment on that? Well, uh, I I depends. Uh, I I think that if you are looking at I and I. Issues being solved with cure in place lining, you have to make sure that there's gasket sealing technology involved, whether it's at the pipe end seals, whether it's at the connections, whether it's at the top of the lateral towards the house. In my opinion, that's the only way to ensure that cure in place pipe technology can also be used for INI abatement. Um, I would comment on that as well. That is, um, and I completely agree, CIPP is a good technology um, if your aim is to provide structural rehabilitation. Uh, however, if you are looking to mitigate or even eliminate INI, uh, it is important that some sort of a sealing technology be used as an accessory technology to CIPP itself to achieve that. Let me, let me, let me uh, summarize it then, okay? Um, we, 
we, we basically understand CFEP technology, good technology, but when we look at a, at a collection system, we need to look at the total collection system because we also know that there's leakage coming in through the main line, there's leakage coming in through the lateral, there's leakage coming in through the manhole. So, so we know we got three points of leakage. So if we line a pipe, a main line, we're not necessarily going to solve all the water problems. We're going to solve the structural problems. We're probably going to stop any leakage from coming through the joints, and, and uh, but they'll come through the joints and they'll and they'll tr track along an annular space behind the CFEP. And guess what? Wherever we have a service connection cut, it's going to come back in again. Or uh, as, as we found out with grouting years ago, as we line pipes and we seal the pipes, the, the groundwater level rises and then it will come in at the next joint of, of the service connection. So we, we really, we've, we've really accomplished part of the problem. In order to get a really a good uh, system is that all three components need to be addressed and they need to be leak proof uh, as best as possible as industry uh, uh, techniques allow. And that's the way to remove infiltration. I'll give you a quick example. Up in Boston, we did a project many years ago. We lined the pipes. We lined the, the laterals all the way up to the commercial buildings. This was up in the, in the harbor area. There was 600,000 gallons of, of tidal flow coming into the sewer system. As uh, the tide went up, the, the sewer system would flood. Tide went down, was, wasn't an issue. We sealed the manholes as well. We used hydrophilic end seals. We used all of the things that were available to us in the industry. And the uh, MWRA wrote a very, very specific article on how we removed 600,000 gallons out of the system. But it, it, was a, it was a concerted effort of doing the entire collection system, not one component alone. Does that kind of answer the general question? That, that, yeah, we need, it needs to be a comprehensive yeah. approach to I&I, &I and, and, uh, right. and, and like Sahar said, you know, it's not just a CIPP thing. We need to incorporate other, you know, other things with it. Exactly. Um, and make sure we get the whole system. Right. I, I'm going to, we have room for about one more, and I'm going to actually try to do a twofer here. Um, it's more or less the same question twice, but is it possible? for the inspector to work for the contractor, or should the inspector be hired by the manufacturer? Obviously, generally, the inspector represents the owners. So I think that's kind of Tim and Sahar. Maybe you two want to comment on that. Um, as a manufacturer, um, it, it, it is a fact, uh, like you just said, Mr. DeBorda, that the inspector is hired usually by the project owner to assure that his requirements, uh, his or her requirements are being met. Um, but um, as a manufacturer, I see no harm in actually uh, having an inspector on staff. Um, and the way, the way, while we may not have an exclusive, um, or rather an, uh, an uh, exclusive person who does just inspecting, the way we make sure that um, our, we are still following the quality assurance program that we have in place and quality control is being performed is by making sure that our own um, field crew is in fact trained and certified um, is either um, or, or rather both by uh, certification programs like NASCO and um, having our own in-house certification training. Um, so like I said, while we may not have a dedicated person to inspection, we are at the same time making sure that the personnel on site are trained and certified to perform these inspections. Tim, did you have a comment on that? Well, you know, when you're looking at a municipal project, uh, when I was involved with the city of Cincinnati, they actually hired contractors or uh, engineering firms, or they call contractors, to to inspect um, inspect the project. So you had a contractor uh, inspecting a contractor, and uh, I can tell you, I had no issues with that type of setup as long as the inspectors were trained. Uh, certified, they knew what they were doing. Um, obviously, if they were just contractors checking on contractors and they weren't certified, would have had an issue. So, um, you know, I really have no issue, and I, and I think each city is different. Some of them will not have uh, contractors or engineering firms inspect uh, contractors, and, and others want their own um, own inspectors on site. So, really, it's a it's a mix. Personally, I see no problem as long as, as they're uh, trained and certified. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, well, uh, that's about all the time we have for questions. Um, and I, I know we did not get to all of the questions. And I tell you, I look at that as a good problem. I really appreciate uh, all the interest in this. Um, I know we're going to work with uh, WEF to try to put, put something together. Uh, but again, I want to thank uh, our panelists. Uh, and I also want to especially thank LMK for really supporting us. And I want to turn this over to Rick Gage uh, from LMK. Uh, and I believe Rick has a few words to say. Rick? Hi, I'm Rick Gage, I'm Vice President of Business Development here at LMK Technologies. Uh, we've been really proud to have uh, partnered with uh, WEF and NASCO to bring you this uh, educational webcast. I'd also like to uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to give you a brief insight into uh, LMK. LMK is a uh, trenchless technology provider located in Ottawa, Illinois, which is approximately 60 miles southwest of Chicago. LMK has developed trenchless processes that are covered by 70 plus patents. Um, we also manufacture and fabricate the support equipment for these trenchless installations. Uh, we offer uh, support equipment for these installations. We offer several technologies. And uh, the first one that I'd like to talk about is the T-Liner process. It's a main lateral pin in place connection lining system. Uh, it's been in use since 1996 with over 50,000 successful installations in the ground. Uh, we have utility contractors and municipal contractors that install this uh, technology. To name a few, we have the city of Portland, Oregon, uh, the city of Salem, Oregon. And this technology can be easily specified by using the ASTM F2561 standard. The T-liner by LMK is a one-piece, uh, cured-in-place, main to lateral lining. Uh, it offers uh, a fully structural connection at the main, utilizing gasket sealing technology. It can be inverted from the main line pipe up the lateral to a distance of 200 feet if necessary. Uh, it offers uh, engineered tapered materials on the ends of the main line portion to allow for maximum flow through the main line pipe. It has a lateral ID which identifies who the installer was, the manufacturing date, and also the uh, address to the service connection. And these materials are manufactured in a quality controlled factory setting. The next technology that we uh, offer is a sectional to mainline cured in place system. Uh, it's been available and, and used since 1993 uh, with over 100,000 plus successful installations. Again, some of those uh, city municipal contractors that would install this technology are City of Portland, Oregon, City of Tulsa, Oklahoma, City of Wichita, Kansas. And this system can be easily specified by using the ASTM F2599 standard. Um, some key points about this system is that it's an inverted mainline spot repair, uh, can be accurately installed anywhere in the main by mainline pipe. Uh, this liner and bladder assembly is vacuum impregnated on site through what's called a translucent bladder so that as inspectors and technicians uh, can visually verify through that translucent bladder that the liner is becoming 100% saturated, ensuring uh, that the resin is uh, completely saturating that liner and ensuring no dry spots. This liner can also be structurally designed per the design calculations of ASTM F1216. Once vacuum impregnated and pulled into the launching device, the launching device can be pulled through the main line pipe and be accurately positioned anywhere in that main pipe. And then by air pressure, the liner is inverted, ensuring that resin contacts the hose pipe and migrates uh, into the open joints and voids, therefore mechanically locking the liner in place. Uh, this uh, system also utilizes the engineered tapered materials on the ends of the liner to allow for maximum flow through the pipe. Mainline diameters range from 6 inch to 42 inch, uh, and the repairs can be anything from 1 foot long to 100 feet long uh, in one installation, depending on the pipe diameter. LMK also offers a, hydro, a family of hydrophilic sealing uh, products, better known as Insignia. Insignia has been around and available to, uh, to LMK since uh, 2005. Uh, these products are currently used with manhole-to-manhole -manhole linings, 
spot repair linings, lateral linings, and main collateral linings. Uh, these gaskets are specifically made of hydrophilic neoprene rubber uh, with a design life of 60 plus years. So if you incorporate the gasket sealing technology of 60 plus years in conjunction with a tiered in place pipe that offers a 50 plus year structural design, what happens is over time as water uh, tracks in behind the liner and tries to penetrate back in the collection system, in a 24 to 48 hour period, these hydrophilic materials begin to swell. They put 100% compression around the cylinder of the cured in place liner and they seal the system watertight. So now for the first time, you have uh, your design life of your cured in place that matches your service life of 60 plus years. So 50 years, 50 plus years and 60 plus years, you have a great uh, system for sealing out water and the structural integrity of the cured in place pipe. When it comes to manhole lining, LMK offers two systems. Both have been available since 2005. Or they've been available since 2005. Uh, one is CIPMH chimney. The other is CIPMH manhole. Um, these again are installed by private contractors and municipal clients as well. One such private contractor is Kenny Construction out of Chicago, and then a municipal contractor is Porter Tower Joint Municipal Authority. Both use a stretchable, one size fits most lining. The CIPMH chimney addresses the top three feet, what we call the chimney portion of the manhole. The CIPMH full depth addresses all the way down to the bench of the uh, manhole. Then LMK offers a trenchless cleanout installation system called Vacuity. It's been in use and available since 1998 with well over 100,000 successful installations to date. Uh, some of those contractors, one would be the city of Naperville, which is a suburb of Chicago, and another would be B. Frank Joy out of, uh, of the Maryland area. The Vacuity is a PVC saddle that snaps on uh, and is adhered to the exterior of the lateral pipe. Once we verify we have a, uh, a non-leaking connection, then access a uh, borehole is created through the crown of the pipe, and then the technicians have access going upstream or downstream um, to do CCTV, regular maintenance, and even install cured-in-place linings. And then there's the cured-in-place lateral lining system. Uh, it's been around since 1993 with well over 150,000 installations, successful installations to date. Um, some of those contractors, just a few to name, are City of Roseville, California. Uh, another one is Pipe Flow out of uh, Canada. Uh, some of the benefits to this is that uh, this technology uh, can renew these laterals from one access point, whether it be a manhole, an inside cleanup, an excavation point, or an outside cleanout. Um, the liner and bladder in this situation is the, we use the, the translucent bladder, so the liner's inside. Uh, the uh, liner is vacuum impregnated on site, a very clean system. Again, the uh, translucent bladder allows the inspectors and technicians to verify resin saturation. And then from the uh, access point, the liner and bladder are simultaneously inverted. Therefore, when in lining from an outside clean out, um, the technicians are able to line the lateral and do a, a repair of the lateral without lining the riser pipe. Once the uh, installation has been completed, the technicians can introduce uh, what's called, a, uh, they introduce a, um, a push camera in through what's called a camera port. And they can push that camera through the translucent mm -hmm. bladder to the, uh, to the end of the lining and verify a successful installation before reaching final cure. That is all I have to say about LMK Technologies. If you want more information, please visit us on our website at lmktechnologies.com. Thanks a lot, Rick. And, and I want to thank LMK for all their support uh, for this web, uh, webcast, but not just for this, but for all the support you've given NASCO over the years and, frankly, the industry as a whole. Uh, thanks uh, to WEF for uh, teaming with, with NASCO to, to put this on. I want to thank the presenters, and in particularly, I want to thank everyone who's actually taken the time to to, uh, to call into this web uh, webcast. We do hope to have answers to the questions out. We'll be working with WEF on that. And thank you, uh, and have a great day.
The organizer has ended the session and this call will be disconnected. Goodbye.